I'm going to be talking about RenderMan for Houdini today. My name is Wayne Wooten. I'm the uh, software development uh, manager for the uh, RenderMan team at Pixar Animation Studios. And today I'm going to be uh, kind of breaking my talk up into two parts. The first half of my talk, I'm going to be talking about RenderMan in general. And then I'll shift to uh, giving new developments on RenderMan for Houdini. And then I'll end my presentation with a uh, live demo on my laptop here. How many of you have seen Toy Story 4? OK, some of you will see some spoilers today. Sorry about that. I'll start with the trailer. Everyone, Bonnie made there a friend go. in class. Oh, she's story. already making friends. No, no, she literally made a new friend. I want you to meet Forky. <gasps> Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Ah. <gasps> He's a spook. Yes, yeah, I know. Forky is the most important toy to Bonnie right now. We all have to make sure nothing happens to him. Woody, we have a situation. I am not a toy. I was made for soup, salad, maybe chili, and then the trash. Freedom! Buzz, we've got to get Forky. Affirmative. Why am I alive? You're Bonnie's toy. You are going to help create happy memories that will last for the rest of her life. Huh? What? Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey. Oh. Bo? Forky, come on. Bo? Bo? Hi there. My name is Gabby Gabby. We can't stay. <laughs> yes, you can, boy. Ah! What are you doing here? No time to explain. Come with me. We need to get back to our kid. Aw, oh, Sheriff Woody, always coming to the rescue. Bonnie needs four kids. Woody, who needs a kid's room when you can have all of this? Wow. Woody, aren't we going to Bonnie? We have to find the... What do we do, Buzz? What would Woody do? Jump out of a moving vehicle. Let's go! Yeah, you gotta go, you gotta go. You know, you've handled this lost toy life better than I could. Open your eyes, Woody. There's plenty of kids out there. Sometimes change can be good. You can't teach this old toy new tricks. You'd be surprised. Bonnie? We're going home, Forky! God only knows Kids lose their toys every day. I was made to help a child. I don't remember it being this hard. Woody, somebody's whispering in your ear. Everything's gonna be okay. So that uh, that was Toy Story 4. Uh, Pixar uses quite a bit of Houdini in our pipeline these days, and Toy Story 4 was no exception. They used it for the rain sequence, they used it for foliage, they used it to drive the light, animated light sequences in the carnival, fireworks, you name it, it, it gets a lot of use. So um, I'll give a little bit of background on where we're at with RenderMan. We released RenderMan version 22 about this time last year, right before SIGGRAPH. And the key focus for RenderMan going forward is uh, improved user experience. And in order to get improved user experience, we want to increase our performance because fast software is good software. And if you watch Scott's earlier presentation, an artist wants the software to be interactive, responsive, and for them to ex you know, ex experience what they expect when they move sliders. And so that was our key focus with RenderMan in this new release. Um, so one of the ways we achieved that was we completely rewrote the uh, rendering API. So instead of using uh, rib, we now have direct uh, C++ calls, and all of our plugins were rewritten to make advantage of those direct C++ calls. Um, we rewrote our ray tracing core uh, from the ground up, and so uh, we have a much faster ray tracer. Um, we improved our light importance sampling, so in many of the shots you see you know, at Pixar and Coco and Toy Story 4, we have thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of light sources in the scenes. And having this really good light sampling is a uh, key to making those types of scenes work. Um, <laughs> we added a particle accelerator? No, um, we actually improved uh, 
the uh, speed of rendering particles, so uh, a significant improvement in when you have millions of particles in your scene. Uh, as well, we overhauled the curve primitive, so uh, significant improvements for uh, furry creatures, something RenderMan's really strong at uh, creating. And the final result of all this work, this was a, a lot of engineers really pouring their heart and souls into the software. Um, the time to first pixel, we kind of count that as the time you hit render till the time you see things starting to show up on screen is over an order of magnitude faster. Overall, time to convergence to that final render is 2x faster. Um, and we managed to achieve these speed ups uh, while also reducing memory utilization. And, uh, and, the, and as a result of all this, we have a much more stable and robust interactive experience with RenderMan. And that, you know, really helps the artist a lot. Um, you, you'll see some of that later with my demos. Uh, we call this the, the cat that broke the internet when, when this picture came out uh, with Toy Story 4. A lot of people were upset. They're like, how did they, why did they put a real cat in Toy Story 4? Um, now, this is actually a computer-generated cat. Um, we actually generated some, some bigger cats recently that are uh, also on movie screens near you um, as well. So, uh, and you know, as part of all of that effort to generate these, uh, these furry cats, uh, in general, our renders of curved surfaces is about 6x faster with RenderMan 22. Um, I have a quick little demo of a RenderMan bake-off here. And so this is, um, we have uh, challenges each year where we get artists, artists to make scenes uh, using RenderMan. And this was the winner a couple years ago. And this is the kitchen scene that's now kind of become the USD teapot. And so you'll see this kitchen scene. Uh, used in a lot as you know, kind of a test data set for USD. Um, in this specific version, there's a lot of texture. There's over seven gigabytes of texture, lots of detail, you know, dirt on the stove and scratches and nice, you know, rough reflections on the toaster. Um, but what I have here is kind of the time to first pixel for the past three versions of RenderMan that we produced. So I'll go ahead and push the start button. Obviously, RenderMan 22 starts nearly instantaneously. RenderMan 21 is a, is a close second. If you're using RenderMan 20, you really should upgrade. <laughs> you should stop using that version. And then there's RenderMan 20. So it was about four seconds with RenderMan 22. It was about 22 seconds with RenderMan 21. And RenderMan 20 was way behind. Um, and this is only with uh, three years of development work in between these, these three releases. So again, we put a lot of effort into making our software much more interactive. So um, in addition to uh, performance, uh, we made a lot of other core improvements. Um, we can now important sample emissive volume. So if you have a volume that basically uh, is an explosion or generates light in your scene, we can now treat that as a light source and you, you, know, you don't end up with all these red sparkly fireflies in your scene. Um, we, uh, of course, integrated the NVIDIA Optics AI denoiser. So you can really, you know, uh, as you, if you were here earlier, it really helps um, with lighting and looking through the noise. Uh, we have a new uh, machine learn, online machine learning system that helps with our light sampling. It discovers uh, as you render which lights are occluded and can upgrade its sampling over time as it learns where those lights are in the scene. Um, we added a wireframe shader node for folks who like to make breakdowns. That's always a, an important thing. Um, we added some cylinder lights. So in addition to your standard rect, disk, and sphere, you can do fluorescent lights, which fortunately we don't have any of them in, in this room. Um, we added cryptomat capabilities. So uh, it seems to be a, a really nice standard for pulling smart mats in Nuke. Uh, volume extinction is a new feature. It's uh, really nice to do fog volumes, but then dial in your extinction for how quickly it extinguishes lights. Uh, this is a key one. One of the nice features of RenderMan is it checkpoints. So as you render, if you stop your render, you can then restart it at, on some other machine or at some later point in time, and it'll pick up where you stopped. But we also added the ability to do this with uh, deep renders. So you can also checkpoint your deep, deep render output. Uh, we recently improved our displacement and made both watertight uh, subdivision and uh, polygonal surface displacement. And, you know, a whole lot more. Um, this was just the core improvements kind of in the first half of the year up until uh, 2019. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about what's new uh, since the beginning of the year. We just released RenderMan 22.6. 
Um, and it have a, has a lot of new features. Some of these came in 22.5, 22.6. Uh, we do better bucket sampling. So we have an adaptive sampler, which really helps reach convergence by sampling the areas of the image that are important. Uh, we've recently improved that algorithm. So overall render speeds are 10 to 15% faster. Uh, you can now have interactive displacement. So you can modify your uh, displacement shaders and watch it as it updates the geometry live. You can also do interactive volume adjustments. So you can feed in shaders into the density of your volume and uh, watch that update live. Uh, we improved our vector motion blur. And this is especially important with Houdini, which is very much driven with vector-based motion blur. Um, we improved presence. This is what we uh, also, it's also known as opacity, but presence is more of a hit or miss style opacity. We've made that faster and less noisy. Um, we added a neat uh, curvature pattern. So you can basically drive your shading based on either convex or concave amounts of curvature on your geometry. And uh, recently we just uh, made a RenderMan for Mari shader. So if you go download uh, RenderMan, you'll now see a new product, RenderMan for Mari. And uh, you can interactively preview NGL as you're painting in Mari and get you know, a close approximation of what you would see if you then pulled those maps into RenderMan. And another neat thing a lot of people ask for this is the ability to live edit your sample settings. So change your adaptive sampling parameters, change your min samples, max samples. You can now do that while you're rendering. So another key uh, advance, and this one's uh, fairly interesting, is open shading language. RenderMan has always been a SIMD architecture, even back in the Rays days. And um, most recently, uh, joint collaboration with Intel Pixar and Sony Picture Imageworks, we've added that capability uh, to our version of open shading language. So it's new as a RenderMan 22.5. Um, what it does is it basically dynamically schedules your open shading language shaders for vectorized execution on Intel Xeon hardware. So if you have an AVX 512 machine, it'll execute 16 floating point instructions simultaneously. Let's say you're doing a multiply, you get 16 multiplies in batches simultaneously. You don't have to do anything. RenderMan just does this all under the covers for you. On average, we get about 15% total render time speed up. The actual shader execution time might be significantly faster. And we have seen up to 2x uh, total render time speed ups on Pixar scenes. Uh, studios that are, have full OSL shader networks like Pixar would benefit from this immediately with RenderMan. And um, all OSL users will benefit from this. We're pushing this back into uh, the open source repository. So um, you'll just be able to download and build open shading language and get SIMD capabilities. Uh, USD. Uh, USD is obviously a big deal, especially uh, with the announcement of Solaris. Uh, Houdini has done an amazing job. The side effects guys have done an amazing job of integrating USD into Solaris. Um, I always like to read this out. Universal scene description is Pixar's open source file format, an API for describing CG scenes and data in a composed manner to facilitate concurrent workflows across multiple applications and artists. Voila. <laughs> um, this is a screen grab of uh, our, US, our new uh, USD view with uh, RenderMan uh, Hydra Delegate. Uh, running on it. And we've got a little piece of our most recent artist challenge, which is a, a cabin scene. And I've just isolated some of the geometry in the scene and uh, disabled the other parts. Um, obviously, USD is a huge component of Pixar's production pipelines and has been for a while. This is just a neat little demo that Atiti did where he just goes and disables geometry in the antique mall by just you know moving from the camera backwards. And you can kind of get an idea of the complexity of this data set. Um, and each of these are just file references. So the actual file that pulls in all the stuff for the antique mall is ra rather quite small. So he can just quickly enable and disable these geometries. A lot of studios are now adopting USD. Um, this is just a few of them. Um, and of course, it's um, getting increasing adoption. And uh, with Solaris, I imagine that will ramp up quite a bit. Here's our uh, RenderMan USD roadmap. Um, I just kind of put on the uh, 1905 uh, USD that you can get on GitHub back in April. 
And then in June with uh, 1907, we made the RenderMan Hydrodelegate open source. So you can go download the RenderMan Hydrodelegate. You have the source code. Um, if you build that version of USD and you have RenderMan, you can immediately start using RenderMan in both USD View or Solaris or any other USD applications you have. Um, obviously, we're going to continue working uh, both with SideFX and the USD team on the uh, RenderMan Hydrodelegate uh, as we move into the future. And we're also working really hard to do batch support of USD. So you can envision taking these uh, USD shot assembly files and just being able to type you know, something equivalent like PRMan dash render blah shot dot USD. So now for uh, the part of the talk you all came here for, RenderMan for Houdini. So RenderMan for Houdini uh, is a uh, hard work of a lot of engineers at Pixar, but uh, I wanted to call out specifically these engineers. Uh, Sarah Forcier is in the crowd. I'm hoping she can answer questions at the end with me. Um, she's the principal engineer for uh, this new product. Uh, Katrin Batrant, Bratland, and Ian Shea also did uh, significant contributions to this. So what is RenderMan for Houdini? Um, RenderMan has always, always worked with Houdini. We've always had a really close relationship with side effects. We both have similar philosophies about everything being procedural. We understand the power of proceduralism. Um, and what we wanted to do with this new version of RenderMan for Houdini is streamline the user experience. Now, this teapot's not very streamlined, but when I was making this teapot demo, um, it was a pretty streamlined experience. Um, some of the key differences in this version of RenderMan Houdini than in the previous versions of RenderMan for Houdini is it's a complete rewrite. So the previous versions of RenderMan for Houdini were based on a, a Soho interface. This is a Python interface and rib-based. This one is all C++ and uses our new direct rendering APIs. Um, I mentioned that it's a direct renderer. Um, the idea behind this version of RenderMan for Houdini is to make it as seamless and simple as possible. So a Houdini artist who's used to using Houdini and Mantra or any renderer can just kind of fire up RenderMan for Houdini and it will behave as they expect. Um, and another key difference is the plug is, plugin is now being released by us. So if you want this new version of RenderMan Houdini, you would go to Pixar's website to download and install it. And one of the cool things is, um, we get to test this uh, new product with the TDs at Pixar. I'm gonna show a sequence at the end of Toy Story 4, which will be a spoiler. Um, and they didn't use this version of RenderMan for Houdini with it, but they are using the new version of RenderMan for Houdini. So um, uh, one of the nice things about uh, this new RenderMan for Houdini is we've tied a lot of RenderMan specific features into it. Um, one, one feature that people have asked for a lot is a texture manager. So if you drop down a JPEG or an EXR image or you know, basically any file format that uh, we can convert, we now have a new texture manager that will automatically manage the conversion of those image assets into the Pixar texture format. So you're not having to fiddle with converting the textures manually and dealing with those assets yourself. Um, we also have a new uh, preset browser. This is basically a material library that lets you store not just materials, but light rigs and also HDR environment maps. I'll give a little demo of that. Um, we've embraced Houdini's Material Builder. It's a really nice uh, feature that lets you uh, simplify complex shading networks and only expose those parameters to the shading artists that uh, um, they would need to deal with. And I'll demo that as well. Um, light filters is another, another great, uh, neat feature with RenderMan. Um, normally, you want to set up your lighting rigs and not, you know, you kind of dial those in with nice intensities and stuff. And then you'll tune your lighting. Pixar tunes their lighting a lot through the use of light filters that modify that, uh, those light rigs. And of course, uh, we can execute RenderMan procedurals as well. I think I have a fun little demo of a blow your top off with all these great features. Um, so a little bit of the roadmap before I switch into my live demo. Um, we released RenderMan for Houdini just recently with uh, 22.5. So you can kind of think of that as the .o release. Um, it, it got a lot of great reception. Um, we're just including a lot of new features with the newly released 22.6. Um, we added uh, Disney's P-Tech support. Uh, we improved search paths. 
We added a lot of new menus to make the user experience more seamless. Um, curve and hair improvements. Uh, the ability to add spare print, like the RenderMan attribute and parameters in a sparse way as opposed to just a huge matrix of them. Um, better render region and better uh, render view stability. Um, and you know we're gonna constantly be adding bug fixes and improvements. Um, we're trying to engage the community very closely and listen to their feedback. Um, for the future releases, Solaris support, that is the, the key thing coming in the future release of RenderMan. We're working uh, closely with uh, side effects for this and uh, Chris gave a demo of the RenderMan support uh, earlier today. Um, another uh, new feature that we're working towards is multiple display rendering. Currently with RenderMan 22, if you start rendering in another display, it stops rendering in your previous display. So you can't do like a four up with four different render man views at the same time right now. And of course, it would be really nice to be able to do flipbook renders in Houdini. That's a feature we currently have in render man for Maya. Um, and so we're looking to do that. And of course, continued bug fixes and, uh, and improvements at, based on um, audience feedback as well. So uh, what would a marketing presentation be without some nice uh, endorsements? Uh, Chris Rydalk at uh, Blue Sky uh, was really great at giving us lots of feedback on uh, making this uh, plugin work really well. Um, and uh, Eugene uh, at uh, Rockstar Productions also really enjoyed uh, using RenderMan for Houdini. And then Matt Estella, he'll be giving a talk later on today, was also really, uh, really positive about this experience. So now, Yes, we Canada. So one of the uh, the things uh, that's really great with working at Pixar is that they gave a, gave us permission to use the actual production asset for Duke Kaboom in my live demo. So a little bit of uh, for those of you who don't Hi, know who Duke. he is, who's the cowboy? Duke meet Woody. Woody meet Duke Kaboom, Canada's greatest stuntman. Huh. Oh yeah, huh. Huh. Yes, huh? he's posing. Huh. Duke, Duke, we need Hold to- Hold on, one more. Oh yeah, what brings you back, people? <laughs> so Duke is, is quite a fun character. Um, so he's a new character. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, I'm gonna switch over to a live demo of RenderMan for Houdini on my MacBook Pro <laughs> using Duke Kaboom as a hero asset. So what we have here is uh, a nice little setup. We have, we have Duke Kaboom here. And I'm just gonna go ahead and start rendering him. So RenderMan will fire up here and uh, there he is. And uh, we can go ahead and lock our camera, move the camera around and you can see, you know, even on my laptop, this is a pretty quick, pretty fast experience. We can put him through his poses. I always like the, uh, you know, jump up and uh, Legs out pose. <laughs> and you know, we've got the full facial expression. You may have noticed that, you know, this isn't quite like what you saw in the movie. It kind of looks like an OpenGL render. And that's because we're using what we call our visualization integrator. It's really fast. It's a really quick and dirty way to check out your shading, but it's not really doing light transport. This integrator only has a headlight for the transport. And so you don't get shadows and you don't get a, you know, you can't see through glass and things like that. Um, but with RenderMan, we can switch to a lot of different integrators. Um, for instance, if I want to drop down an occlusion integrator on here, we, we can see Duke Kaboom, you know, with occlusion. It's really kind of cool. And it's quite, quite responsive as well. Um, this is all just CPU rendering on my laptop. One of the neat thing is, is rendering to our uh, image tool is I can point and click on thing, on pieces in the image tool and you can see that it's talking to Houdini and it's actually selecting geometry in there, in, in Houdini, in their render view. Um, I noticed that the ground plane isn't quite touching the motorcycle. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna try to translate the ground plane up. One of the nice things is with interactive rendering, you know, and this occlusion integrator, you can kind of really see where things are intersecting with the geometry. Of course, I can also just zero it out. But you can't always do that. It's not always uh, easy to do, uh, easy to eye eyeball without this integrator. 
So now I'm going to go ahead and switch over to, um, I've already created an integrator that is our unidirectional path tracer. It's called PXR path tracer. And we'll switch over to that. So now this is uh, doing the full shading with full light transport, multiple bounces. I have, uh, I think I have at least uh, 10 levels of bounce of diffuse bounce running in this demo. Uh, one of the things you may have noticed is that the, uh, the backdrop is not subdivided. So I'll show a little bit about uh, uh, at render man specific attributes. So I've selected the backdrop here. And if I just click this shelf button, add spare parameters, it'll create this render man tab, which contains all of the attributes, geometry, prim vars, and, and other settings for all the various pieces of geometry or other assets you might use in Houdini. In this case, I'm going to go in and I'm just going to convert the backdrop to a subdivision surface. And you can see, voila, we got a nice curved backdrop there. Uh, most of Duke Kaboom, I'm actually not rendering with subdivision surfaces right now because, well, it's a Mac laptop. But I am rendering his face and his helmet and stuff with, uh, with subdivision surfaces. You can also, um, if you just don't want all of these attributes on your geometry, uh, this is new. You can go in and edit the parameter interface and just add the ones that you're interested in placing on the geometry. Okay, so that is attributes. So next up, let's talk about shading. Obviously, he kind of looks like Judd, uh, Judge Dredd here with you know this weird helmet on. and The eyes are what really convey the emotion in the character. So what we're going to do here is we're going to switch over and apply some shading to his helmet and his visor. This gives me a chance to uh, talk about our preset browser. Um, so our preset browser is a, a custom RenderMan material library that lets us basically, you know, keep collections of HDRs. And we have these little thumbnails, which give you, you know, an idea of what the lighting scenarios might be. You can also drop in light rigs. I don't have any. Oh, I do have some light rigs here. Nice. Um, but uh, we also just have a huge material library. And fortunately, because I'm not a shading artist, uh, a shading artist has built a Duke Kaboom material library for me, which is rather convenient. And I've selected his visor, and I can just go ahead and import and assign this visor material to Duke Kaboom, and voila, you, get a, you can see through his red, Canadian red visor. And let's go ahead and select his helmet, and we'll go ahead and import and assign that material as well. So you can see uh, the helmet and the visor here. One of the neat things is, is these are the actual production textures used in the movie. So these are like 8 and 16K UDIM textures that I'm applying on the fly to this character. here. All right, so um, let's say that we don't like the fact that he has a red visor. We can drop over to the material here and drop into our shader network, which is, you know, not horribly complicated. But uh, if we drop over here to our PXR surface material, uh, this is a, an Uber shader, which has 160 plus parameters. Fortunately, I know where most of them are. So I'm going to hop over to the glass shader. Oh, I think I'm on his helmet. Let's, uh, let's select his visor and hop over to his visor material. I was like, there's no glass on that material. OK, so this is his glass. And you know we can change the color. Let's say we want him to have a green visor. We can watch that. But you know it's a little bit slow to update there. So I can draw out a render region in our image tool, and I'll just turn it on to uh, auto render so that whenever I make a change, it's now just going to update within this render region. So you know don't quite like green. I could switch it to blue. It's a little bit dark, so I could, you know, make it lighter, and it gives you this kind of glass look, just kind of like a clear glass visor. Um, but that's a bit off model. I'm not sure, you know, the powers that be would approve something that off model. So I'm just gonna uh, do undo here, and I'll just undo it back to the red visor, and we'll, we're back to the red visor. So this is great, um, but you know, as I mentioned, this, this uh, shader has a lot of parameters, and there's a big shader network here. 
So what we can do is we can utilize Houdini's material builder. So let's say that we only want the artist to, um, for the visor, really all they're interested in is the reflection, the refraction, and the color of the visor. So if I hop up here, we now have a material builder node that is presenting itself with just, just these three parameters. So the artist doesn't ever really have to dive in there and, and deal with hundreds of parameters and dozens of shader network nodes. And you know, I could, I could drop the refraction down and give him like a welding helmet look, which is kind of cool, but again, a bit off model. Or, you know, I've got this Pixar Atrium dome light in here, which is giving this distracting kind of specular reflection by his eyeball. Um, so we can just drop that reflection down, you know, just so we can see. We do cheats like that all the time. The character's expression is the, uh, is the key, key thing here. So that is shader editing. Uh, there's one more little quick thing I wanna do with um, shader editing. Let's see if I can uh, jump out and we'll do a uh, demonstration of uh, displacement mapping. So let's say that we want Duke to go um, off-roading instead of uh, instead of you know these nice slick tires. Let's see if we can give him these kind of. I'll zoom in a little bit here. Bumpy tires. So we'll select just the tire here. Let's see. And. Zoom in on that, and we'll go over here to the tire network, and we'll jump in, and it's a pretty complicated network. But what we see here is I've got a displacement shader, and currently the displacement is zero. So I'll bump up the displacement there. And hopefully you can see it. You can start to see these knobs, but they're kind of fat. You know, those, aren't, those don't look really like knobby, you know, motocross tires. So I can go over here to the frequency of my shader for the bump signal, driving it with a checkerboard. Bump up that uh, frequency, and then Duke has these uh, Duke has these nice uh, knobby tires now. Uh, can you guys see that from the uh, from the side there? Yeah. So so that's his uh, knobby tires. So let's see if we can. Uh, jump over here to this view. And uh, so now let's do some uh, lighting workflows. So if I want to, uh, you know, he's kind of dark. I'm gonna drop in like a standard two light scenario. So I'll put a light in front of him and you can look through the light. I've dropped down a light. So I'm kind of looking through the light source here. And let's go ahead and scale this light source up because the scene is modeled in, I think, centimeters. And we'll go over here. And I like to kind of drive my lights, you know, kind of to the extremes and then kind of back off to where it looks like a good intensity. Um, if I was using like a Linux or a Windows workstation, we could use the optics denoiser on here so you wouldn't have to look through the noise as much. But uh, it, it only uses NVIDIA hardware and that's not available on my laptop. Um, and so let's make this a, a warm light. So we'll go ahead and do that red, and then we'll hop over here to this camera, and we'll we'll put a. Let's see, why is he not pivoting? What have I set? Oh, the camera. There we go. So I should be able to center on him. There we go. And then we'll drop a camera down here. And this, I mean, a light source. This light source will be a, we'll make this one blue. And we'll give him a nice, you know, a nice bright rim light on his helmet there. And uh, get a nice color. We'll go back to the camera. And you can see he's got this nice glow on the back of his helmet. Um, and so it's pretty easy to set up lighting interactively with Duke. Um, but I mentioned that we also did uh, light filters. So I've already set up some uh, a light filter here. 
And this light obeys enable and disable flags, just as you would expect. So I've got this nice, uh, you know, Canadian flag logo uh, to the side here. And this, uh, this gobo, you know, you can uh, translate around. So you can see, you know, gobos, cookies, slide projectors, they're all kind of the same thing. Um, different names for the same thing. I can also modify the parameters of the filter itself. I could change the color and the, the scale. And so, uh, so you end up with this nice, uh, nice lighting scenario. But one of the things that's, that's interesting is I like the blue highlight on his helmet and his motorcycle, but I don't really like how it's interfering with the, uh, the uh, light filter. So what we can do is we can do light linking. So I can select the, uh, the backdrop here and I can go over to the render tab and I can go over to the uh, light mask and I can say that I don't want PXR rect height <coughs> two to shine on the, the ground. And so there you have it. You've kind of cheated that light to only shine on Duke and his motorcycle, but not to affect your, uh, your uh, other light source. And so that's, uh, that's lighting. So next up, I'm gonna um, quickly shift over to a few more features. Um, one is uh, our pipeline workflow. So I mentioned that we can do render man procedurals. And so let's see if we can load a quick view here. My hotkeys aren't working as I expected. Um, so we'll just highlight. We have a bearskin rug here. I'll see if I can, and yeah, my hotkeys aren't working on the bearskin rug. Not sure why those hotkeys are not working. But I know the rug is over here. So one thing we can do is we can import uh, materials uh, in materials. We can import like a limbic geometry. So I'm gonna go ahead and import a bearskin rug. It's gonna be over there. And we'll select that geometry. And you, you can kind of see the lights, but I'll, I'll, I'll up the uh, intensity of the, uh, the dome light here so that we can see in the, the rug a little bit better. And not only can we uh, import the, uh, the rug, we can also run a procedural that imports the fur on this rug. And we do that with, um, uh, geometry shaders. So what I have here is um, uh, a material that's a, a geometry material. So if you can see here, I've got the bearskin rug, which is the uh, Alembic procedural. And then here, I'm basically able to apply a SOP network, which is this previously created delayed read archive. And when I pull that in, it'll load in the fur and then start rendering the fur. And then you would be able to see the fur on this geometry, although I'm not quite seeing that. All right, well, it's not loading my fur, but if it was loading the fur, you would get an idea of the fur there. But in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on to my next demo. And that is my um, confetti demo. So um, one of the things that they showed in the uh, demo with Solaris is the ability to do point instancing. And we support point instancing with um, RenderMan as well. 
So I'll go over here to this uh, geometry object. I can't, I'm not quite sure why my camera is not focusing on my geometry. Normally it's space G to focus on something, but it's like it's not in that mode. All right. Um, so, folks have ideas of how to focus on something besides space G? <laughs> space F? Yeah, that's not working either. It's actually modifying this, uh, this parameter over here, but. Okay. Escape and? And then F. No, nope, it's still modifying this window here. Okay, well, I think that might be a Houdini issue, but that's okay. We can find the confetti cannon over here. I'm gonna have highlighted it. Oh, that's lots of wear. Uh, the confetti cannon might be hard to find. Okay. I will skip that part of the demo, but I do want to show a more impressive part of the demo. Uh, Side effects worked with us to make a, uh, a fiery hoop. So Duke Kaboom in the movie jumps through this hoop, and we thought it'd be really fun if we could make a, a fiery hoop. Um, so let's go ahead and lock our camera and head over there to that hoop. Um, and you'll notice that you can see it in the render view, but you currently can't see it in the uh, RenderMan render. And that's because we obey the uh, render settings on the render node. So if you go over here and select your objects, you'll notice that we're telling it to exclude the Duke Kaboom hoop and the hoop fire. So I'm going to go ahead and put it back. And you can modify those live. So I can now, I'm loading a uh, rather large uh, VDB file and the, uh, the hoop. And actually the fire is at a different frame number. So we can see here that we've got Duke's hoop is now visible and we've loaded fire. One of the neat things about RenderMan for Houdini is that we're actually loading the uh, the uh, VDB data structures directly in memory. You don't have to round trip your VDBs to disk anymore in order to render them. So as I'm modifying this VDB uh, simulation, it's actually pulling it from memory. So if I go ahead and put in like frame 324, it'll switch over to live, it'll switch over to a different frame once Houdini ingests that VDB and you can kind of see the animation update there. But not only can we update the, uh, the simulation live, we can update the shader live as well. So if we go over here to uh, our hoop fire, we can jump over to something called PXR Fireball, which is a shader that uh, one of our shader TDs wrote. And uh, we could basically turn the fire, let's make it green flame, I like green flame. And so, uh, you can see that it went ahead and modified the, uh, the shader for that quite quickly. Um, we can also, you know, modify the intensity of the flame. It takes a little bit longer because it has to re reconstruct the <coughs> data structure. But basically, we can, uh, we can really quickly craft the look of our, of our flames interactively um, with RenderMan for Houdini. And this gives a nice... Uh, a nice quick way to dial in the looks of your uh, volumetric and simulations. And uh, it, that's, a, that's a really key capability when uh, trying to you know, set up your looks of your shaders. So, and so that is the end of my demo. Thank you for attending. So, yeah. Uh, to, uh, thank you. That was a cool presentation. Well, for one second. Let me have Sarah come up real quick because she sure. might answer questions better than I. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I have two quick questions about the new stuff. So um, when would you use like the uh, the new curvature shader as opposed to the, the dirt? Um, yeah, before. Yeah, that's a good question. Do you want me to? Yeah. Okay. So um, Pixar Dirt uses um, a ray tracing algorithm to basically provide like an ambient occlusion look to it. And Pixar curvature is a little bit faster. It's basically using the curvature prim var from the geometry itself. Okay. And it just gives you a much quicker, you know, ability to do that kind of dirt kind of stuff. I see. And it works with, um, unlike the PXR dirt, it works with both convex and concave. So you can decide which one you want to utilize in your shader network. Mm, okay, cool. And then a similar question. When would you choose the, to the new uh, emissive volumes over like more traditional ways of uh, lighting up higher or like energy effect? Um, Usually we, you would use emissive volumes, like for instance, in this case, in this demo here, um, I think I have enabled emissive volumes. Yeah, I, I've, the checkbox is as a light source. Um, you wanna use that when your fire is close to like a diffuse surface. Like right now the fire is close to this ground plane and it's gonna cast a lot of fireflies onto that diffuse surface when it's close. But if you're using emissive volumes as standalone elements that you're going to comp in at a later point in time, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily want to use that because it will slow down your sampling. Right. Like it's, it's quicker if you don't need the extra capability of it, treating it as a light source. Okay, cool. Thank you. And for that, you get a prize. What? <laughs> a little goodie bag from Pixar. <laughs> Next. Yeah, back. Uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, quick question, with Solaris coming around, do you still think you'll need a, a standalone render viewer or are you gonna use Houdini's native one or what are your plans going forward with that? Yeah, um, so with Solaris coming around, we're gonna be switching to their native render view. Um, basically, uh, you have so much more interactivity and the fact that you can use the manipulators in that render view uh, just makes it a better artist experience. So yeah, in the next RenderMan for Houdini release, you know, we're gonna be supporting Solaris and then that will also include the Hydra Delegate support and the integration of the manipulators and you would see RenderMan you know, over here in this viewport. Now this does work right now. Like I can go ahead and, you know, I can drag out a render region here and it'll start rendering now. And you can use manipulators in this render region now, as you can see here. Um, but it's not quite as fast. You know, this is kind of the old way of doing things. And the Hydra Delegate is just gonna be much more responsive. So <laughs> you're gonna wanna shift, you know, I can, I can move, you know, I can kind of see where my camera's moving there and stuff. But yeah, that's a great question. And you get a prize too. Thank you so much. Any more? Okay, can I ask a question? This is a trick question, and whoever answers it gets the special prize, which is a Duke Kaboom figurine along with a bunch of other figurines. Uh, the first person who can tell me what is the name of Duke Kaboom's kid in Toy Story 4? Does anyone know? Is it too hard of a question? <laughs> All right, let's think of a different one. Have you got a different one, Sarah? I'll let you think. What? A question for winning a prop. Um, oh, man. I put you on the spot. <laughs> yes, you did. Um, does anyone know the name of the next Pixar movie to come out? <sighs> there we go. I think you yeah. You went. <laughs> All right. Well, if there are no more questions, thank you for attending. <laughs>